I'm here basically to talk to you about um, the role, the potential role of community pharmacists in oral health care. Um, oh, excuse me. Yep. Um, and everyone, please call me by the name of Wong. That's much easier to, to, uh, to remember. So I know this is generally a last slide thing, but I, need the, I really need to pay tribute to those who are driving the research. Um, so I've got three students at UQ, and this is where we're located. This is the School of Pharmacy in Queensland. Uh, and they're really the forerunners and push the projects out and, and get the results uh, to show evidence. Um, we also, I also collaborate very closely with Dr. Christopher Freeman. He's a pioneer in uh, primary healthcare research and pharmacy practice, uh, pharmacy in GP practices. And also, I work directly with uh, Professor Pauline Ford. She's the head of School of Dentistry at the University of Queensland's Oral Health Centre. And also Kate Kelsey Pateman, who's oral health practitioner. <coughs> I also work closely with inter, interstate practitioners, so here in Victoria, Professor Hani Kalash, and he's been instrumental in actually drawing us all together, pharmacy practitioners and dental um, health therapists and dentists uh, from institutions like um, Deakin University, La Trobe, University of Melbourne, as well as UQ to bring about projects to show, um, develop programs uh, in pharmacy practice for improving oral health care. So, just a little bit about myself. Uh, why am I interested in oral health? Uh, personally, I'll just give you a brief uh, story. My mum uh, had, I think, four natural teeth by the time she was 30, um, and the rest were implants. And so I've grown up uh, seeing how that has affected her quality of life, uh, how implants fail, and that will affect what she eats, what she chooses to eat, how she chews. Psychosocially as well, she um, is uh, quite embarrassed, obviously, when she... Uh, is in a picture. I don't think I can recall one picture where she smiles because of, of this um, issue. Um, so these are, these are, I guess, personal things that you realise uh, oral health isn't just a compartmentalised kind of issue. It affects the rest of the body, okay, all aspects. And I'm not talking about systemic. Um, Professor Jorg had talked about this morning as well and covered that very well. Um, so the second point I wanted to make is that oral health, uh, no one is excluded from oral health problems. Okay, we can look at statistics, and, and again, I'm just going to highlight a couple of those in Australia. Uh, and, and more prominently, I guess, half of 12-year-olds have permanent uh, decay in their permanent teeth, right? So in future, that's going to mean future restorations. They've lost the natural integrity in that tooth. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a sort of downward spiralling effect. There's other statistics which you also have been shown, and I won't go into that in detail. Um, but it's important to really mention that those who don't have access as well, who have poor access to oral health. And, and they mainly include people who, you know, older people, frail, um, Indigenous Australians, people with physical or intellectual um, disabilities, uh, and also rural people in, of low socioeconomic status. These are people who obviously don't receive the attention or an access that they should be receiving compared to the natural population. <clears throat> so this reflects how much we spend in Australia. The, uh, dental health services expenditure was $9.5 billion, and that's the latest um, stats that I could find. Uh, that's about 5.9% of the national health expenditure uh, in Australia. Anyway, the more th what you're probably interested in is why pharmacy and why oral health? Uh, what role does pharmacists have in oral health? So if you think about a pharmacist, you go around to your community pharmacy, uh, I don't know what you have in Victoria, but imagine Terry White's, Maloof's, uh, Amkel's, you've got all the different chains there as well, and chemist warehouses. Um, you, you'll think traditionally, you know, compounding and dispensing. We have a service model that pays for that, and yes, that's what you think we do. <clears throat> but if you've been following the industry in the last five years or, or even ten years, you'll notice that there's been a momentous change in the way that we're focusing our services. We're trying to change the model in which how pharmacists are getting funded, no more on just dispensing, but rather on providing primary healthcare services to expand and obviously help improve the uh, public health in communities. Um, <clears throat> so I'll give you some examples, okay? Currently, the federal government has an agreement called the Community Pharmacy Agreement. It's a five-year agreement worth $19 billion in a five-year period. And that funds not only dispensing, but primary health care services. And one that you probably do know of, if, you, if anyone's a general practitioner here, is the home medicines reviews. So what happens is, if a patient is polymedicating, they've got lots of medications, they um, may be having um, adverse issues with their medications, drug interactions, misadventure, 
the GP would, would ask a pharmacist to go out to their home and they would basically sit down, go through the medications, determine if there's any issues relating to the medication taking or any other factors that might influence their health in general and re relay that information back to the general practitioner. So there's a collaborative arrangement there of primary health where we get funded, the GP gets funded, and I think um, from evidence there is improved outcomes in terms of medication taking in and overall health and adherence and so forth. <clears throat> so that's just one example of a primary healthcare program. Um, we also have stage supply, so people who are opioid dependent perhaps or have risk of abusing medications, we can uh, tailor and ensure that they're receiving only a certain amount of medications in an allotted time. So these are just examples. But what you probably haven't heard more, more of is that pharmacies are improving, enhancing the scope of which they practice in general. Okay, so you've probably, I'm not sure you've seen, uh, are you aware that pharmacists now are nationally able and accredited to um, provide immunizations, influenza vaccines? That's something that they can do with obviously training and accreditation. It's not offered at every pharmacy. Um, and there's trials now under the pharmacy trial program which are testing whether pharmacy, community pharmacies can establish, uh, sorry, screen assess type 2 diabetes in the pre-stages and manage these patients in collaboration with the general practitioners as well. So we're really getting out there, changing our scope of practice and, and how we can influence the community health. <clears throat> uh, this is just another thing. So internationally, you know, governments are recognising that pharmacists can identify and address oral health, oral health issues, which can lead to significant costs later down the track if they're un, uh, un, not looked at. <clears throat> so the question you want to know, uh, I guess, is, you know, do pharmacists have a role in oral health care? My personal opinion, I believe we don't really have a choice. That's just my opinion. When I practice, I've been practicing for quite a while, uh, I can tell you that <clears throat> not only during the weekdays, but specifically more on the weekends, at least one in five so what's that, um, you know, 20% or one in 10, so 10 to 20% of my patients would come in with an oral health issue, okay? And you might not think that's a lot, but uh, I tell you, it, it's, it, it's a fairly significant number. You know, these are, these are missed opportunities that you know, I think pharmacists could definitely be part of. Um, and the range of things they've shown me is incredible. I, I you know, do I have a picture? Yes. It, everyone will show me their mouth. I'm, you know, everyone is so keen to just open their mouth and go, have a look, what is going on here? I've got pain or I've got some lump here, some abscess, some periodontal issues. I don't, you know, and I'm looking at them. And, and because I've sort of immersed myself in this, this sort of field, I, I, I actually enjoy doing it. I love doing it. I actually like looking at people's mouths and saying, look, I think this is probably the issue. But, you know, like, you know, you know I'll, I'll triage you to the right person if I can't handle it. Um, oh, sorry, I've skipped some slides. Um, so, yeah, uh, you know, like we see lots of different issues presenting to us on a daily basis. Let me give you some facts. Um, well, firstly, I think the reason why they do this is because, A, uh, on a Sunday, dentists, most dental practices are closed. I try to call him and try to create collaborate. I did this last week. I tried to call the closest you know, dental um, practice to see what a patient needed, because he obviously needed emergency dental treatment. Nothing was open around me. Absolutely. I had to send him to emergency. Um, but anyway, people, I think, are trying to, and you'll know this better than me, but they avoid wanting to see a dentist, right, for, for multiple reasons. Yeah. And you can, you, can, you can obviously imagine the reasons there. But let me give you some facts about pharmacy in general. Um, in Australia, about 90% of the population will visit a pharmacy every year. And on average, and the average Australian will visit the pharmacy about 14 times a year. That's opportunity, okay? Um, Community pharmacists are respected, trustworthy, and knowledgeable health. So when I say trustworthy, I, you know, maybe we'll talk later, but I've to, I, patients are not afraid to show me whatever they've got. And I could, I could tell you stories that, are, that would blow your mind, right? But so when, they, when I say trustworthy, there's a, probably a limit to that anyway. Um, they provide numerous services to patients without charging. This is important. You know, we don't charge any fees. And we don't make, there's no need to make an appointment to see us. They come and wait. And, you know, if we have the time, we'll come and see them one-to-one -one and see what we can do. Yes, there are business uh, restrictions and barriers in that sense, but I think that is a, an appealing factor, uh, one of the factors for patients. Um, I'm just going to go on some facts again, and please tell me if I'm going way over time. But if you look international... Yeah. Sorry? I will. <laughs> okay. Uh, in the UK, you know, two-thirds of pharmacists receive regular consultations um, from their patients about oral health. And, and 
and if you look in India, obviously much more dense and populated city. You, you know, on a daily basis, you know, farms about 80% say they see 10 or more um, visits about oral health each day. Okay. Um, What's pretty cool is what I, when I did a Google search, um, looking at UK and what they're doing, some pharmacies have gone to the point of actually, and I don't know how the model works, but they have dentists coming into the pharmacies to perform services. So this, this dentist here uh, is using this kind of technology called Velscope. I'm not sure if you'd know that, but I don't know it myself. But it's a fluorescent kind of image that shoots onto your the mucosal membrane, and if it fluoresces, you're fine. If it doesn't fluoresce, it's unhealthy, that tissue, whether it be inflammation or so forth. So the farm, you can see there's some kind of collaborative effort going on, which is really good. I think that's excellent. Uh, we're recognising the need to have oral health in, in the pharmacy sector as well. But my interest was, OK, internationally, there's a lot of things going on. What about Australia? What's actually happening here? And there's actually no studies that I found in 2014 that addressed this issue. And so. I want to look at essentially um, what our potential role could be, and uh, I, I developed a study uh, as a national study uh, to look at the, which had three objectives. Essentially, I want to look at the attitudes and beliefs of pharmacists taking on this role. Are they keen to do it? You know, what's their perspectives on it? Uh, I want to know also the types of inquiries. That, what do people come in for and ask? You know, to show pharmacists and what the fr what the frequency of that is. You know, so we can get some kind of measure ab about about this. And also, we know that tobacco smoking has oral adverse oral health consequences. So, do pharmacists implement smoking cessation therapies in that sense as well? Um, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, um, cognizant of the time. But essentially, we ran a national survey. Um, we tested it for validity in terms of content, face, the usual things who, for reliability as well. Um, and we essentially addressed those three objectives uh, that we want to find out. We started collection in 2014. We basically thought, what's the best way to disseminate this survey? Let's, co let's uh, collaborate with the PSA, the Farm School Society of Australia. They're the largest pharmacist member organisation in Australia. They have 20, no, sorry, they have 17,000 members. So what we did is we asked them, and the, my collaborator Chris Freeman is the uh, associate, oh, sorry, the vice president of the PSA. So he helped me get these connections as well. But we basically publicised our survey uh, with their newsletter. And if you've ever done research in data collection for survey work, you probably know it's pretty hard to extract information from, from participants, unless there's an incentive. And we found that it was, yeah, really difficult to get response rates. So we went, to multiple, we went through multiple options, social media, uh, as well as publishing in other venues as well. This is the results from the study. In essence, um, well, this is the demographics, I should say. Um, we had 144 pharmacists that completed a valid survey. Uh, we'll complete the yeah, valid survey. Um, in terms of their age, the gender breakdown, and where they practice, so in Victoria we had 39 participants. Uh, we had a pretty good representation of our sample versus what was the national statistics. So it yeah, tells us some clue of, of, of representativeness, representativeness there. Our first uh, objective was what were pharmacists' attitudes to oral health care provision? We found that nearly everyone, 93% of pharmacists, thought that oral health care was within their role. Okay? You can look overseas, you can see the stats there. It's the same kind of situation. We found in this study about 80% uh, of pharmacists regularly saw, like, had consultations with, their, with patients uh, on a weekly basis. And so we weren't really surprised to see such a high number, I believe that. Um, what was more surprising to me was how many pharmacists believed they were capable and confident of handling these presentations. Um, you know, I've gone through the university system in Queensland. I have an idea of how pharmacists are educated nationally in oral health care, and they don't get very much. And, but here we see a high report of pharmacists thinking that they are confident. So we, that's something I'm going to test later on as well. Um, what was probably positive that I thought was the proportion of pharmacists that wanted further training, okay, which is 97%. Nearly every pharmacist wants training in oral health care. When I went to a conference last year, the PSA conference, we had a room, a lecture theatre, probably three or four times the size of this, completely full. We had a, sorry, an invited speaker, a period, periodontist from Sydney, and it was completely full of pharmacists, um, which kind of showed you uh, the level of interest that pharmacists have to want to know more. But we, unfortunately, the opportunities don't always present themselves. 
So anyway, this is just some, some data which I'm talking about. Um, what are some of the, the things consumers came in about and asked pharmacists about? So, sorry, this is a bit loaded. And what I just want to really show you is that the, the patient, uh, the, the range of symptoms and problems that patients come in for is quite varied, okay? So we have things such as, the most common is analgesic medication for tooth pain, right? You've got NSAIDs, paracetamol, all that kind of stuff. Mouth ulcers, oral thrush, toothache, and so forth, dry mouth and whatever. Um, this is the frequency by which pharmacists had seen these patients on a weekly basis, and this is how confident they felt in handling these presentations. What I want you to notice really is that uh, about, don't do the maths, but I've already done it, so it's about 60 to 80% of pharmacists saw um, presentations such as mouth ulcers, old thrush, toothache, uh, at least one to five or more times each week on a regular basis. And they were reported to be very confident in handling these presentations. Okay, the reason why I think they're confident is because pharmacists are therapeutic experts. They know about the drugs, they know about all that, and all these general um, issues have medications to treat it. So they might be mixing the, the understanding of, of handling and uh, appropriately handling and the medication use. Conversely, if it came to uh, advice provision, pharmacists weren't as confident and didn't receive many consultations. Okay. Um, who actually manages most of the presentations in the pharmacy? Pharmacists, then assistants. Uh, what sort of spoke to me and Chris was that the pre-reg pharmacists, the intern pharmacists who are trained to be pharmacists, uh, don't get much exposure whatsoever. And, we're ex and they're expected in the next year to provide primary health care services, particularly in oral health as well. So that's um, an interesting uh, finding. Uh, what are pharmacists' knowledge of nearby dental practices? So collaborative work. The majority of pharmacists were aware of their closest dental practice, sure. Half of them knew, had met their, their dental practitioner and were aware of their opening times. But what I guess um, we were a little bit uh, disappointed about was how many emergency arrangements were organised between the pharmacy and the dental practice for you know, very common uh, oral health issues which needed emergency treatment. And this kind of reflects the level of collaboration that we currently have between the pharmacy sector and you know, dental practitioners, which I think can much more investment should, should, be, uh, should be focused upon. The last uh, topic was what pharmacist smoking cessation practices uh, were for patients who had existing oral health problems. Um, so people who, who, we know that smoking has detrimental effects with or is a risk for oral health problems. Uh, so we asked pharmacists, are they comfortable asking about the smoking status of patients who come in uh, with an oral health condition? 76% said they did, they were, they'll, they're comfortable with that. But when, when they actually reported, if they asked about the smoking status of the patients, only 8 and 17% said that they did always or most of the time. And we think that the barriers related uh, to this low proportion is probably because pharmacists might fe be fearful of alienating their patients when they start delving into smoking you know, characteristics. Um, also, they're not, not probably even associating tobacco smoking with negative oral health consequences, so there's a lot of education that needs to come in, in place there. Um, nicotine replacement patches were the most common form of um, smoking cessation therapy provided and offered by pharmacy, which is great for people with oral health issues because there's less side effects associated with patches compared to gums and so forth. Um, so I won't bore you with any more, any more results. So basically, I'm, I'm just going to summarise what, what the study found. The majority of pharmacists were regularly consulted on a variety of oral health presentations and were, felt they were confident in handling them. Okay? Um, pharmacists, more than assistants, handled the presentations. Only about one in ten pharmacies had some kind of arrangement with a dental practice when there was a need for emergency uh, consultations, which I think is a poor, <laughs> poor finding. Uh, um, in terms of the level of relationships we have. Pharmacists believed it was their role to deliver oral health advice in the community. However, only a small proportion inquired about smoking status, understandable. And nearly all pharmacists, on a positive note, nearly all pharmacists desired further education and training to benefit their practice. Okay? Um, so I won't go through this. This is more study-related material. Um, where to from here? 
That's an important question. Um, so in this study, we found that a majority of pharmacists thought they were confident, they felt confident handling oral presentations, such as mouth ulcers, gum disease. That's all self-reported data, okay? We want to know in practice, what are they actually doing? Is it according to guidelines, okay? Are they actually appropriately referring people when they should be? Are they, are they working according to standards that they have been given as, as practitioners? And so we applied for a couple of grants and we, and we were very fortunate and blessed to have received those. Uh, the first was the, uh, from the Australian Dental Research Fund and um, as you might already know, uh, oral cancer, well, there's 3,000 cases diagnosed every year. Um, patient delay is probably the, the contributor, a major contributor to worse prognosis for it. So, and pharmacists see a whole bunch of ulcer, mouth ulcer lesion presentations on a daily basis. So why not see if pharmacists can what they do in a situation where a patient uh, has something that's potentially neoplastic, right, potentially cancerous. Um, so we did a mystery shopper study. That's the best way to, to sort of see how, what practice really is, okay? Just send people there that have no idea who, who they are, pretend to be customers, and see, you know, record basically how, they, um, how the interaction goes. So um, this has all been analysed now because it's just been recently completed. Uh, but what we're finding is, yes, they aren't really, uh, a fairly large proportion of pharmacists and pharmacy staff aren't um, practicing according to standards. And even though pharmacists are recommending more uh, appropriate recommendations compared to assistance, the overall picture isn't, isn't very positive in that sense. So that will be published hopefully soon. So that's, sorry, that's the image of a potentially neoplastic ulcer. The next study, is, uh, that we did this year was a national study. We contacted about 2,000 pharmacies around Australia, community pharmacies, and we sent them basically case vignettes uh, to assess their level of knowledge, to see what they knew about certain oral health presentations that they commonly see, and are they practicing according to those standards? Um, we also want to know um, what areas they wanted further education, okay, because that's imperative. I think to establish, establishing collaborations, they need to be aware of, their understanding needs to be uh, improved. But anyway, I won't go into details of that. Um, and we're still analysing that data, which should hopefully come to publication soon. Uh, next year, we want to further this work. And the area we're investing is, is to understand from the consumer point of view, the stakeholder, the ones that come to pharmacies, what do they want to know? Uh, what do they want pharmacists to provide them? What services in oral health would they be comfortable seeing their pharmacist about? Are they willing for pharmacists to provide extended services such as potentially fluoride varnishing, you know, preventive services, which can easily prevent a lot of the, the you know, you know st poor statistics that we see in, in, in the public, uh, in the health expenditure. Uh, so we're doing a qualitative study and we've also applied it for a grant to look at um, and this is in collaboration with Hani Kalash, is driving a lot of this work as well, uh, the feasibility of introducing children's oral health promotion services in rural communities, so those who have poor access to oral health care. Um, yes. So anyway, we want to develop training programs to support pharmacy staff. That's one of the outcomes. Take-home messages, uh, I've mentioned them, but I will go through them again, essentially, that pharmacists and their staff are well-placed. They really are. I mean, they're essentially located... At, there's actually um, agreements to, for distancing of pharmacies. Um, are well placed to identify customers at risk of poor oral health and take every opportunity to educate those most at risk of oral, oral health problems and triage to dentists okay, um, or doctors. More research is needed to identify current oral health practices, knowledge gaps and other barriers that, uh, to, to move, to extend the scope of pharmacy practice. Um, I'll just jump to the final point. Um, it's important for pharmacists to know local dentists and where to refer people. Um, this is probably the key thing I want people to take away with. Uh, at the grassroots level, I think pharmacists and dentists and general practitioners can do so much more to collaborate. And it's as simple as potentially just picking up the phone and giving the dental practitioner a call and just introducing yourself and coming up with novel ways of, of you know, understanding what each other does and how we can help each other. Uh, so this is a picture that I kind of like. I think, you know, alone we can only do so much, but when you 
start depending and putting your tr you know, trusting other health professionals and collaborating with other health professionals, you really make a network of, of um, improved healthcare for the community. That's it. Thank you.